Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Dice at the Mises Institute, and I want to welcome you to our private seminar. Wish all of you a happy Friday afternoon. And uh, first and foremost, thank those of you who are donors to the Mises Institute for the first time. That was sort of the impetus behind this uh, private seminar was that we wanted to offer a kind of inside baseball reward to some of our new donors who participated in our fall campaign, which we do every September around Mises' birthday. And we'd also like to welcome and thank all of you who are longtime donors who know about today's stream. And for starters, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Bob Murphy, who's joining us today from his home in Massachusetts. So hi, Bob. How are you doing? Hi, Jeff. Doing well. How are you? Well, so I want to give a little bit of background. Uh, for those who we're um, part of the fundraiser. You'll know that uh, this book, "The Middle of the Road Leads to Socialism," is headed your way uh, as a small thank you, a token of appreciation for participating. This is actually a pamphlet. Uh, it consists of a talk which Mises gave in 1950, called, of course, "The Middle of the Road Leads to Socialism," and its topic is interventionism which we will discuss with Bob as sort of a third way kind of thinking between pure capitalism and pure socialism. Now, as a little background, he gave this talk at the University Club in New York City. Uh, those of you who are familiar, this is just a little bit south of the park. Uh, the Mises Institute has been fortunate enough to hold some events there. We have some members who are members of that club as well. Uh, Judge Napolitano is a member of that club. And we've had events there, I believe, with David Stockman, for example, uh, I was able to have lunch there a couple years ago with the judge. One of the fascinating things about the club is that there are plaques, large plaques on the wall in the lobby uh, dedicated to members of the club who were killed in what was then known as the Great War, what we now call World War I. Of course, they didn't know World War II was coming. So if you look at these plaques, you'll notice that you know, almost by definition, if you were a member of the university club in the World War I era, you were probably from a wealthy family. You were probably or almost certainly an upper class kid. And so the soldiers who are commemorated, you know, it gives their names. It says Princeton, Harvard, Yale. So these were clearly members of the officer class. But what was so interesting to me and what I mentioned to Judge Knapp is that, you know, back then in World War I, the children of rich men and women uh, went off to war. They may have been officers, but they went off and they got killed. And I was asking him, I wonder how many current members of the university club are veterans of Iraq or Afghanistan? And I think we both agree that the answer was not many. Uh, so that's just a little background uh, regarding the university club. Now, in terms of this book, the, the reason we thought it would be such a great premium for the fundraiser was that it reads absolutely accurately today. It's incredibly prescient uh, Mises identifies interventionism as a third way, again, between pure socialism and pure capitalism. And really, this is the dominant thinking today. If you read this booklet, you're going to understand essentially what we're up against today across the West. And what I mean by that is that when we think of dominant uh, social, economic, political paradigms of today, like social democracy, especially in Europe, like neoliberalism, which sounds like a very vague term, sometimes used almost as a slur, but it really does, I think, in a sense, accurately define uh, the elite political view of the West, which is that, yes, we have some degree of perhaps grudging respect for capitalism and private property and markets because we see that they work better. But we also have a very robust social safety net. We have egalitarian ends. We have uh, you know, social democratic goals. So in other words, socialist ends, capitalist means. And I think that pretty accurately describes the state of the West today. And that's basically the thinking of our political class here in America, whether that's a Mitt Romney or a Liz Cheney or a Hillary Clinton or a Joe Biden. So there's a lot to be had from reading the short essay. You're going to be able to read it in about 20 or 30 minutes. And I think you're going to, you're going to really enjoy it. And it's always fun. I think it's always worthwhile on a weekend or otherwise, give yourself a little bit of time to get inside the mind of Mises because you will come away refreshed. You'll come away better for it. So all that said, Bob, I, I want to start with you. And I want to, I just want to bring up the, uh, this idea of a third way. You and I are old enough uh, that when we were back in school taking political uh, science classes, they used to have this term mixed economy. And I don't know right. if anybody still uses that term anymore. So give us sort of your overarching thought on this uh, speech of Mises. 
Well, right. Like you said, Jeff, it really is amazing that you can imagine some things would be pretty dated, but yeah, Mises, this reads fresh, it's relevant today. If, you know, if, if somebody gave this speech today, it would, it would work, except for a few of the references to, you know, when he's talking about the war, um, you know, there need to be more context there. But other than that, yes, it reads perfectly. And, and he, what he was pointing out then is, is we, like you say, Jeff, what they say today is that he, everybody agrees pure capitalism doesn't work. But they also agree that, oh, socialism, pure socialism doesn't work. And so that's mm -hmm. why all reasonable people, you know, must advance this, this third way. That, like you said, what's in the textbooks, you know, we learned is the mixed economy where there's heavy government intervention. But it's, you know, to ensure that the outcomes aren't too extreme or too radical, um, you know, to, to soften the edges of capitalism is one way that I've, I've heard it. And so, yes, yeah, so that's that's what it needs to be or that's, you know, where the, the conversation is. And also, um, I think you're right, Jeff, to link it. I, obviously, we, we are in tune with a lot of people who are worried about nefarious influences, people trying to undermine you know, what the U.S. stands for or originally stood for. And there's different enemies, let's say. And I think sometimes people lump them together and assume like the Davos crowd are a bunch of Marxists. And no, they're really not because like the people that run central banks, where they actually, they, they know pure socialism doesn't work like you say jeff for them you know it's means to an end they don't believe in natural rights or anything but they they understand if you're gonna try to run the world you need it to work you need the planes to fly you don't you know want to have just shortages and people starving to death unless you know you want to do that intentionally right? mm -hmm. so it's they they don't believe in pure socialism they understand markets work but they want to still be in charge and so that you know that to understand the problems with the mixed economy is perhaps even more important than just being anti-socialist. And that's one of the things too that Mises stresses in this essay is it's not enough just to be anti-communist or anti-socialist that we need to explain to people why a market economy works and why it's you know noble. Well, a lot of people of our stripe, of course, are starting to wonder, you know, what makes an economy socialist? At what point do you say a country is capitalist or socialist? And I wanna just uh, refer people to a conversation that Murray Rothbard had with Mises. He asked him, you know, what, what's your uh, take? What, how, how would you judge a capitalist economy versus a socialist one? And for Mises, the existence of a functioning stock market was the hallmark of a capitalist society, even with a big regulatory or tax landscape surrounding it. If you have a private stock exchange where ownership in capital companies was freely traded at market prices or relatively market prices, you know, that uh, indicated that this was a capitalist economy. And of course, Rothbard, uh, a little more trenchant sometimes, it, it, there's a variety of places where he wrote that, look, you know, when we talk about uh, the private ownership of the means of production versus the public or governmental ownership, you know, what ownership means is control and direction. So in a pure laissez-faire, uh, let's say an anarchist community, ownership is absolute. You have a piece of property, let's say that's land or a company, you can do whatever you want with it. You can buy it, sell it. You can uh, borrow against it. You can do anything uh, on that piece of land or with that business. And so when government comes along, uh, not in a socialist country, but in an ostensibly capitalist country like the United States, and says, well, that's fine. You own your company. You own your land. But we're going to impose some regulations on you, whether that's land use, whether that's minimum wage, whether that's requiring you to pay taxes on some of the income you make from that business, whether you need to have a wheelchair ramp to satisfy the ADA. You know, all of these things uh, represent, in the Rothbardian view, uh, a loss of control, full control by the owner to the use and enjoyment of this property. So if real ownership is, it's not whose name is on the title, right? It's who actually controls something, a property. Then every time government imposes a tax or a regulation or a rule or a mandate or restriction on property, your ownership shrinks. Your control shrinks. So in effect, government becomes a part owner of your private property, so-called, because it is in at least partial control of that piece of private property. So I think Mises and Rothbard are, you know, there's a bit of a chasm here uh, between the two on what constitutes a capitalist economy. Right. It's interesting. And yeah, I'm again, for the people at home, in case they missed it, the what what I remember Rothbard writing was, was he one time asked Mises, you know, clearly there's the pure capitalism. There's really that stuff doesn't exist today. 
there's governments intervene more or less, and then there's outright socialist places. Is there a, a dividing line or is it just kind of, and, and Rothbard says that he, he kind of expected Mises not to give a crisp answer and was pleasantly surprised when Mises said, yeah, it's, if they have a stock market, then, you know, it's, it's capitalist with heavy intervention. If they don't even allow that, then it's socialism. But what's funny, Jeff, is this very essay, you know, I was just scrolling through to try to find it. So it's like, it's section five for those of you uh, following along at home. And it's, I, I can't speak German, but it's the Zwangterschaft type of socialism. Okay. It starts with a Z. And in that whole section, Mises is saying, in contrast to like the Soviet Union model, you have this separate model of socialism where he says that, you know, this type preserves some of the labels and the outward appearance of capitalism and maintains seemingly nominally private ownership, da, 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 da. But, you know, it's heavily inter interventionist that the government sets prices and wages and interest rates. The government determines each citizen's income, da, da, da. It is the Fanktorship of Hitler's German Reich and the planned economy of Great Britain. So I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think, Jeff, that they got rid of the stock market in Great Britain after World War II, right? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, so it's interesting that it looks like in Mises' writings, he, you know, he's agreeing with you and with Rothbard that yes, you, we, there's there's a point at which government mandates and and, and regulations and whatnot are so overwhelming that it's it's silly to, to speak of it as a capitalist, you know, that it's socialism, that it's central planning. And yet, it, you know, the, in the example, the historical example he's giving there, they still maintain the stock market. So I, it would be interesting if we could ask Mises to reconcile, you know, his writing with, with the answer he gave to Rothbard. So, well, we can't ask him, Bob. Um, I think <laughs> we can ask Murray. If we could. Mur Murray's still writing stuff, but, um, so what struck me is that was pretty harsh, I thought, because he's giving this talk in 1950. World War mm -hmm. II is still fresh. I mean, there are still real privations in Great Britain and in Germany at that time. So to compare Hitler's German Reich and the planned economy in Great Britain, I thought that was, you know, uh, as, as we think of Rothbard is to Mises, Mises in his radicalism was to, let's say, his Mount Pelerin uh, associates. I mean, that's. I think there's not too many economists who would have said that in 1950 would have compared those two countries because one of them's the one of them's the Axis power. Uh, but also, he brings up in in chapter four, he, or he brings up um, the price controls which Great Britain imposed during World War II, uh, and he says, uh, it, you know, I'm sorry, in in part six, he says, when the war came to an end, Great Britain was a socialist commonwealth. So that's really something. And a lot of it goes to this theme, which he has, uh, which namely, Bob, that there are two roads to socialism. There's the, mm -hmm. the revolution of Marx and Engels, and then there's the incrementalism, which they later came to embrace. And I think that's uh, the perfect word for what's happened throughout the last hundred years in America. Right. And there's been you know lots of people like uh, James Lindsay and Jordan Peterson and, and so forth that some of the listeners may be familiar with who have gone through and you know what's sometimes called cultural marxism and you know uh some of the marxists who realized the conventional way wasn't working and so they first had to capture the social institution so that's really a hot topic among certain um people lately like like sort of right-wing um, podcasters and so forth but yeah mises anticipates all that stuff in this speech in the 50s um also to your jeff just to go along with what you were saying you're right. It was brave of Mises to be talking like that, you know, five years after the war ends. And also, too, he said in this that it's noteworthy to remember that British socialism was not an achievement of Mr. Attlee's labor government, but of the war cabinet of Mr. Winston Churchill. So he's also saying that, yeah, the reason there's socialism in Great Britain is, is because of Churchill and, you know, the, the war effort. So, again, you you would that that's a, a a strong thing to be saying, a brave thing to be saying at any point, but let alone at, at this time. So, um, and just for the historical uh, recognition of this fact that, that you know Mises was warning that his for, for those at home who don't know Mises in several places the the fundamental reason he says that interventionism or what's sometimes called the mixed economy or the middle of the road is is not stable. It it, it isn't an alternative. You got to choose capitalism or socialism. Is that piecemeal interventions don't achieve their goals. You put a price control on milk to try to make it affordable for poor mothers to feed their babies, and it just leads to shortages. So then you got to expand it to the inputs into you know dairy production to keep those prices down. And then that doesn't work. That causes shortages there. And so you, you got to either just abandon the price controls or just keep expanding the net. 
and I always thought that was more of a theoretical thing that Mises was walking through, but he's saying, no, that's literally what happened in Great Britain during the war. That initially they weren't setting out to socialize the economy. They were really just trying to ensure adequate material for the war effort, but the price controls, you know, had the obvious textbook effects. So, so I, that's some interesting things that I, I must've read this essay before this speech before, but I had forgotten that detail. Well, Getting back to interventionism and really the core of this talk, in section two, he's talking about the the fundamental distinction here is between socialism and capitalism. So he embraces Marx's term. A lot of people today say we should jettison it. I, I love the term capitalism because it conjures up private capital, which conjures up property. So I, I, I embrace the term. I don't think we should get rid of it. But he, he's basically saying, first of all, he gives a nod to the the to socialists here where he says um you know the question is between capitalism and socialism which is conducive to the better attainment of those ends which all people consider as the ultimate aim of activities commonly called economic all people the best possible supply of useful commodities and services i'm not sure that that's true i'm not sure that i would consider all people today interested in that, like the climate change warriors, for example. I think there's plenty of people in the West today who would be A-OK with a far lower standard of living, provided it was more egalitarian in their eyes. Somehow they're always running the show. So this egalitarianism never applies to them. So that I thought was an interesting nod by Mises because he, you find this thread in a lot of his work saying, you know, you should attack the other side's motivations. This is, this is a, mm -hmm. an exercise in rationality and persuasion to mm -hmm. show them, you know, means and ends, cause and effect, and if we can just make them understand. And now we've got a hundred odd years of, of that to, of the left and our friends to ponder that. But then, you know, a little bit farther on here in, in this chap, this section on interventionism, he says, you know, the, the conflict between these two principles, meaning socialism and capitalism, is irreconcilable and does not allow for any compromise. So they preclude each other, he says. So interventionism is not a golden mean between capitalism and socialism. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, he has to recognize, because that's the world he was living in, the world we live in, that it's possible. I mean, interventionism is a possible means of organizing society, but he seems to be uh, insisting that it's, it's not tenable in the long run. Right. So you made some great points there. And, and yes, it's it, as of the time he gave this speech. Yeah, it does seem like he, he was saying everybody agrees that, you know, what, it, what the economy is supposed to do is just produce more and better goods and services for the people. And it's just a question of how do we organize it? And you're right that modern day environmentalists, for example, wouldn't would, wouldn't agree with that. You know, even that premise. Um, and, and so that's true. And then, and you're right. I, it also jumped out at me too, Jeff, that he, he would say things like, you know, the, the, the price control, you know, which is the aim is to provide more milk to the you know mothers or whatever the government is frustrated in its efforts uh, or, and, and it, it doesn't achieve the end sought. And I was thinking that, no, I'm not sure that, I mean, maybe it was true in the war effort that they really were doing that because they wanted to, to maximize the war effort. Um, but you know, in general, like, for example, um, I do not believe that the members of Congress, when they vote to raise the minimum wage, are doing that because they think they're helping workers or that they, they have never heard the idea that maybe that's going to cause unemployment. You know, they have reputable, not well, right, reputable, but Ivy League economists on their staffs, like they know those textbook arguments about raising the minimum wage. And this was even before the revisionist literature. I'm saying back when every economist agreed raising the minimum wage was going to cause unemployment for teenagers. And so I don't think the people in Congress were unaware of that. I think it was because they wanted to support the labor unions. So they went out and lied about what their motivation was. Don't get me wrong, but in terms of why were they doing it? And so they weren't frustrated by the high unemployment for teenagers. That, that actually wasn't their goal was to help teenagers. It was to help labor unions. And they succeeded in that. Right. So, so um, I think you're right, Jeff, that, um, Mises at times, and whether he's doing it just to be more gentlemanly and to, to keep things above the fray and just to make it, you know, a logical, rational argument, um, you know, maybe it was more rhetorical or whether he really believed it, I, I don't know. But I, I know Rothbard, um, I'm not sure, sure if you would agree with me on this, Jeff, but I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that Rothbard at times, you know, said, I don't know that we should concede that the interventionists actually have just the best of motives and we're just disagreeing about the means to achieve an end. Well, price controls is a great 
uh, example of this. He has a section on how price controls lead leads to socialism. So price control would be a typical kind of interventionism. Uh, he brings up the fact that price controls were used in Great Britain during World War II. And to an extent, at least rationing, which is a form of a price control in a sense, or a supply control, was, was used in the United States with respect to things like the days you could buy gasoline, uh, how often you could buy tires. You know, this is part of the war effort. Uh, so he has this section, section four in the essay, how price controls lead to socialism. And someone asked, I, I, I'd forgotten, but I'm about to link to the online version of the essay here in the chat. So let me just do that real quick for people who want to uh, check it out. But we're going to send donors uh, to our fall campaign a physical copy of this. So I, you're going to enjoy getting that. Uh, but, you know, he points out, hey, maybe well-meaning uh, interventionists who think milk is uh, too expensive and we want... Uh, young mothers who don't have much money to be able to buy milk for their young children. So we'll put a price control, a ceiling on how much you charge for milk. Seems like a simple enough example, but then Mises teases it out, I think, beautifully here. He says, well, okay, but all, unless all the factors of production which go into creating milk, which is, you know, buying dairy cows and having trucks to, to take the milk around and gasoline to drive the trucks and and uh, all, all the other factors which go into producing drinkable milk, unless you put price controls on those, the dairy farmer is not going to be able to afford to put out as much milk as he did before. He might not be able to afford to put out any, depending on where you set the price control. It might be at a price uh, which is below his profitability. So he may, he or she may stop uh, being a dairy farmer at all. So as a result, you know, this filters through the economy and the uh, central planners, the well-meaning interveners find themselves having to place price controls on all of the earlier factors of production that lead to milk. So he has this great sentence here. He says, no branch of industry can be omitted from this all around fixing of prices and wages. Let's not forget about wages too. The dairy farmer has to pay his workers. From this obligation to produce those quantities which the government wants to see produced. So it really is a nasty, nasty thing to do in, to an economy. And I think Mises' couple of pages here deal with it as well, or maybe even better uh, than the short chapter by Henry Hazlitt in Economics in One Lesson. So um, that, that was fascinating to me. And, <laughs> you know, Bob, uh, so, so supposedly someone was explaining the idea of a tax loophole in the American mm -hmm. tax code one time. And this term or this concept didn't exist to him coming over here as a, a sort of an Austro-German. And so he's like, what is this loophole? And somebody explained to it. And he said his response was something like, oh, so that's when they get to keep part of their money. So I wonder if that <laughs> was the context for this uh, part 12, loopholes capitalism. Right. Yeah. I, I was wondering that too. It, it did seem like a like for us today, like that phrase, I mean, we, we talk about tax loopholes, but I don't hear about tax loophole capitalism or anything. So, yeah, I, I was wondering that, too, if um, if that was something that was more popular at the time. Or like you say, Joe, it might just be that he wasn't familiar with the term. And so it stuck out to him, even though it wasn't like a very popular thing to say. Um, I think Rothbard, too, doesn't Rothbard say something like he favors loopholes in the tax hole, loopholes so big he can drive a Mack truck through them or something like that? I, I think that was in like making economic sense, something along those lines. For, for people at home, because some economists, they don't like loophole, right? In other words, there's a theory by which, oh, really, you know, get rid of all the loopholes and have a flat tax that's the lowest possible rate on the widest base. And so like there's um, like Scott Sumner, some of you may know him. He was outraged that they did that the um, the Trump administration repealed the uh, the Cadillac tax on <laughs> on. Um, on, on uh, luxury the, cars, know, Obama had, had put put no, no, it's for health health insurance. Oh, right. Uh, the, so they call it the Cadillac tax because it's like the extra tax on on high um, insurance, high premium health policies from an employer. The theory being that that you know, oh, it's artificial because the tax code has incentives, and so you overpay, and that's why healthcare costs are so high. But the point being that you know, this, a libertarian, you know, who who has a, a large following was really with all the things going on today, you know, that he was really upset that they had, they had effectively gotten rid of a tax loophole. And so I, you know, so I just thought that was funny. So that's, that's the context was, and that's why Rothbard and Mises, I think are pointing this stuff out is there are plenty of market favoring economists who think that tax loopholes are bad because, Oh, it causes distortions and you could have a, a different tax code with lower rates and with no deductions or exemptions. But their point is, yeah, but it's they're the people's money. You know, it's kind of odd to be clamoring for the government to take more people's money. 
Well, the question for Rothbard is where do the interventions end? In other words, once you justify one, it's, you know, uh, an extra tax on Cadillac healthcare plans. It's awfully hard not to justify two, three, and four more. And uh, if you read Rothbard in The Betrayal of the American Right, he talks about his sort of crystallizing moment becoming an anarchist was when he was defending limited government, which, uh, you know, provides national defense, courts, police services. He was defending this to some of his friends, his anarchist friends in the 60s. And they were saying, well, okay, but you pay taxes for that. And then, you know, as long as we can all get together and agree to pay taxes for national defense and courts and police services, you know, what in principle stops us from also getting together and agreeing to pay taxes for uh, public housing or free milk for uh, women and children. You know, in other words, that was sort of his aha moment. And, you know, Bob, we'll wrap up our review of this book with, you know, the last section, section 12, the coming of socialism is not inevitable. I mean, I just want to, to stress to people that the academic climate today, we think of universities as so left-wing and so hopeless and these nurseries of socialism. In many ways, for, for liberty-minded people, the academic environment is far better today than it was in the 30s and 40s and 50s when Mises is writing this. Uh, you know, socialism was considered inevitable. It was taught mm -hmm. as scientific, as inexorable and the next coming thing. It was like technology almost for a, an economy. So, uh, and if you look at the dominant thinkers of that period, I mean, you didn't have places like uh, you know, you didn't have all these free market centers at universities. You didn't have organizations like the Mises Institute. You didn't have all these free market writers who would come along later like Milton Friedman. I mean, it was actually uh, from a an in, purely intellectual point in economics. It, it was a very dark time. And and so Mises uh, was, was writing against a, a tough backdrop where most of his peers really believed uh, you know, in Keynes, uh, certainly, but perhaps Marx as well. And so when he, I think it's important to note when he says it's not inevitable. Uh, and this quote, wow, on the last page of this essay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, which, which political party in the U.S. today does this sound like? Uh, they, quote, they are always in retreat. <laughs> they put up today with, with measures, which were only 10 or 20 years ago, they would have considered as undiscussable. They will in a few years acquiesce in other measures, which they today consider as simply out of the question. What can prevent the coming of totalitarian socialism is only through a change in ideology. So I thought that, wow, you could have written that today, Bob. Yeah, that I had also highlighted that passage as well, Jeff. I, th I thought that was really impressive that he said that. And so, again, just for more of the context there, for those who haven't read this yet, he he's He's ob objecting and saying it's not enough. You, you, the, the the parties of the right, they can't just be against pure socialism and just oh, we're anti-social. Hey, socialism doesn't work and it's tyrannical and you know the individual isn't free because if you try to adopt a middle ground, because that that just leaves the field open for those who say oh yeah yeah we're not socialist, we're not actually Marx, we're just you know we we don't want there to be too many homeless people or you know mm -hmm. mothers struggling to you know poor mothers struggling to give milk to their kids. Hey, that's, you know, that's all we're doing here. We, we know that there needs to be private property and incentives and blah, 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 innovation. We know all that. And so Mises is saying that you're just throwing in the towel when you do that, because it's for the, for the reason, the technical reasons he cites in the essay that for, because you know, you learn economics since the first round of interventions don't achieve their desired goals, or at least the goals that the public is supporting them for, whether it's the actual goal of the policymaker, then um, it's just going to lead to more and more until eventually you get de facto socialism, even if it's still labeled as, as a private market economy. So, yeah, I thought that was great. Um, and what's also interesting, too, though, is that he said that the outcome is not inevitable because I've heard some people, Jeff, criticize his thesis. the saying middle of the road leads to socialism by saying, well, what are you talking about, Mises? There's there's plenty of countries around the world that you know have had middle of the road a stance for many decades at this point. And, you know, we would agree they're not yet socialists. So, what, you know, how, how long do we got to wait for the, for your theory to come true? And I think, you know, he's, he's acknowledging that yes, it, this isn't inevitable. It's not, you know, like, like Marx was saying an inevitable law of nature that socialism has to come. So I, you know, he, Mises wasn't actually predicting, it, it wasn't a pessimistic essay in other words, whereas you would just take it literally Mises would have to be predicting that all the world's going to go socialist because there was no pure laissez-faire economy at the point he gave this talk. 
So that's not what Mises was saying. Obviously, he wasn't just throwing in the towel. Well, I want to turn to some of our questions here for maybe the next 20 minutes or so. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank everybody for donating. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to donate, but you're a free rider on today's YouTube link somehow, um, just go to Mises.org slash middle. And you can donate as little as $5 uh, to just become a supporting donor of the Institute. For $60 a year, you can become a member. We're going to send you a really great one-ounce uh, silver coin uh, with either Mises or Rothbard, your, your choice on that. And uh, you'll be a member, a sustaining uh, member of really what is probably the most radical pro-property, pro-freedom, pro-peace organization in the world. And I think we all realize that these are dark times and we need – Voices like the Mises Institute, to put it mildly. But I want to start uh, with a good question for Bob. We've gotten Mises' take on what constitutes uh, a capitalist economy. We've got Rothbard's. But what's Bob's? In other words, what would Bob call today's economy other than mixed? In the United States, you're yep, saying? in the United States. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, huh. yeah, I guess I would... I, I guess I would I would call it inter, interventionist. Is, is a, I maybe as we go as we go on, if a better label comes to mind. But yeah, I haven't really thought much about that. I had no reason to to search for a different one. But yeah, I would I would say it's a highly interventionist system right now. So I don't think it's outright. Well, it, it's funny with with the stuff that happened in 2020. Somebody could make a case. You know, they they did things there that I not just in terms of business enterprises, but just telling people like you know how many people you can have over at your own private residence. I mean that. I still can't believe that right, happened. Right. But I mean, here we are in a system where money is basically centrally planned. Mm -hmm. um, roads, military, courts, police uh, are, are all literally centrally planned. But then you have ostensibly private industries, banking, insurance, healthcare, education, which are largely centrally planned, although mm -hmm. they have a, a private cronyist element to them. So at some point, I think it's you're not uh, being a chicken little if you're saying that, right, you, you right. know, America is pretty statist uh, and our economy is not nearly as free as we think it is. So, um, and you know, you knew these questions were coming. Um, how far are we from a crack up boom? What uh, Mises called a Kastrafa Hausa, catastrophic, <laughs> you know, the Germans mm -hmm. like to add a lot of syllables to things. Um, you know, where do, where do you think we are in terms of uh, some sort of really nasty fiscal shock? Um, well, it's, I, I think, and I'm curious what your thoughts too are on this, are just, so as, as some may know, like I, I was very concerned with the, the rounds of QE after 2008, and I thought we were going to see significant price inflation. And yes, I know the government fudges the numbers and whatever, but I, I thought gasoline was going to be more expensive than it was say the year 2011 than it, you know, and so, and they can't really hide how much a price, you know, a gallon of gas is in terms of dollars. Um, and but now we really are seeing that, and I think anybody who goes to the grocery store or fills up the you know you you can see that things really are getting very expensive. And despite the tricks that the, they're doing at the retail level with you know putting less food in and the, the packaging is thinner and things like that, so um, you know that that doesn't mean we're going to have a crack up boom right now. But I do think these massive amounts of just the Fed just pumping in trillions of dollars now whenever there's a crisis or, oh, there's a problem in the you know reverse repo, we'll just flood the market there. I mean, it's there's there's no principled constraint now on what the Fed does. It's all just a matter of, you know, oh, expediency. You know, they, anything is on the table at this point if they if they could spin it as, you know, this this is going to be good for the economy or the, this sector's in trouble. So now the Fed's going to come in. Nobody would object you know, on in qualitative terms and just say you don't have the authority to do that. It would just be a matter of, is this going to help or hurt? So um, so since that sort of Pandora's box has been open, I I think, unfortunately, how's this for an answer, that it's when the crash happens, it's going to be quick. Like people won't realize when it's going to come and then it's going to happen fast. So um, definitely they, they can no longer get away with just pumping money in with no no ill effects, because I think, like I say, consumers finally are really feeling the, the tightening, whereas that wasn't as evident back in 2011, 2012. I see, Bob, we have a question about the quantity theory of money. Uh, Dave Howden, many of you know, also a fellow at the Mises Institute, he tweeted something the other day to the effect that if you, if you just had supply chain issues, uh, you know, and, and you had restricted supply for certain goods, the price would rise for those particular goods. 
but because people were paying more money for those, uh, they would have less money and therefore demand would fall and prices would fall for other goods. He said, but when you have prices rising generally across, you know, all or most sectors of the economy, that represents what you and I or, or what Austrians would say is is uh, real inflation, which is, you know, a monetary phenomenon. So what do you think is going on is, with inflation today? Is it supply chain stuff from COVID or is it is it all the money and credit creation over the last 18 months? Right. That's, that's a good point David makes. And that's like I've seen Austrians historically have mentioned that like in the seventies, a lot of people would blame the, the price inflation, like, Oh, that's because of the OPEC embargo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so the a standard sort of quantity theory approach or explanation or response to that would be to say, well, no, if OPEC restricts the amount of oil coming in, yes, the price of oil goes up, but people don't have more dollars total to spend just because of that. That, so that means they have less to spend somewhere else. And so it, that wouldn't cause a general rise in prices just in certain areas. And so, yeah, that sounds. I didn't see Dave's tweet, but it sounds like that's the point he was making. That particular supply chain issues, yeah, can can make prices rise in certain sectors, but you wouldn't ex see this general overall um, rise necessarily. So it's, I mean, I, I guess if it's a completely widespread supply chain problem, so put it this way: a standard definition of price inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. So if the total quantity of output drops 10% because of widespread supply chain issues, even with the same stock of money, technically that could rise, you know, raise the unit price all around on average. But I, I, so I think it's, it's likely a combination of, of both, but more, I would say, Jeff, on the, the how much money they've pumped in. As you know, that with the Understanding Money Mechanics book that we've got coming out soon, you know, I have some of the charts in there for, for people who don't know this, the amount of money that the Fed pumped in in, in 2020 mm -hmm dwarfs what they even did after the financial crisis. Okay. So whether you're looking at the base or M1 or M2, so um, they, re they really did. I think it was masked for a bit because people were panicked. So the demand to hold cash went up. And so they kind of just soaked it up. But now that, and you, you couldn't go to the store and spend it. So that might've hidden it for a while too. But now that, you know, people are able to spend more, I think you're, you're really seeing it. So I, I, to, for me, mostly it's because they pumped in so much money. This is an interesting question from Lucas Jasinski. He says, could Mises' most important contribution be considered demonstrating that interventionism is a dynamic process? Healthcare is a good example. Uh, what does Lucas mean here? What does Mises mean about interventionism as a dynamic process? Okay, so he, and, and I don't know, I, I would have to say what probably the, what Mises means by calculation is his most important contribution. But yes, certainly the, the dynamic process of intervention is important. So it's it's just the elaboration of the, the specific example, Jeff, about the, the price controls, just to say that when you you know you do a first round of intervention and it leads to un, what's often called unintended consequences. So that it doesn't achieve the official stated goal of the intervention. And so then you got to keep doing more and more. And that's you know like what what happens with with Obamacare, for example. That's why even the proponents, like guys like Paul Krugman, admitted you had to have the bad stuff in order to get the so-called good stuff that you couldn't just say, Hey, insurance companies have to cover everybody regardless of their health history. Because if you just said that, then they say, okay, if you have brain mm -hmm. cancer, we'll give you a policy, but we'll charge you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a month in premium. So that wouldn't work. And so then they had to say, okay, you got to have total, you know, universal coverage and the premiums can't be too much higher based on your health history, blah, blah, blah. But you couldn't do that because then the insurance companies just wouldn't, you know, they would just go out of business. So that wouldn't work. You know, and so they had everything that, you know, all the stuff. And then the reason you need the mandate was if, they, if you just had that, then healthy people just wouldn't buy insurance. And the only people left in the pool would be the ones with, you know, serious conditions. And so the premiums would have to be really high. So that wouldn't work. So that's why you had to have the mandate. Right. So th mm -hmm. that's like the, the very structure of Obamacare, you know, the Affordable Care Act legislation itself, even listening to the proponents explain why they did it just epitomized, you know, Mises dynamic that he talked about that, you know, one intervention is not going to work and it's just going to pave the way for more. And ironically, in practice, what happens is the government intervenes, screws things up, and then people point to the screw up and say, that's laissez-faire capitalism for mm -hmm. you. We need mm -hmm. more government intervention. Right. Well, let, can I ask you to just elaborate on the quantity theory of money? We get that from John Locke and others. Mises and Rothbard had criticisms of it as, you know, facile, uh, so, you know, what's the quantity theory of money and what are the what, what's Mises's objection to the quantity theory of money? 
Okay. Well, there's, there's different versions historically. And so some versions Mises would have been somewhat okay with and other ones he would clearly would have rejected. So the, the, the quantity theory, just, just um, saying that, you know, the prices respond proportionally to how, how much, you know, the, the stock of money. So if they, if they double the quantity of money, then you expect prices to go up. And that has, there's like an, an equation that people may have seen that's uh, what is it? There's different versions like MV equals PQ, mm-hmm. you know, so, so the M is the money, you know, the, the number of dollars, let's say V is the velocity of circulation. So like how many times per year on average does a dollar change hands? And so M times V is like the total spending in the time period. And then the P is the price level and Q is, is the level of output. And so the price per unit of good and then times the output is how much. So those two things have to sure. be the same. And, and, and then, and so people can take that. So it's an identity. Like, you know, if you agree with, and, and Rothbard has some good criticisms to show some of the terms in that thing, they don't really mean anything. No, you know, nobody conducts business on the basis of the velocity of circulation of money in the economy. That doesn't, you know, you don't care about that. But if the, if you accept what those terms are defined as, then yet the equation has to be true, but it doesn't follow that if you double the quantity of money, that means prices have to rise. It, you know, V could, could mm-hmm. shrink, you know, mm-hmm. or quantity could go up. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, so there's different things. Um, and so, you know, and Mises beyond just, you know, using it in a crude fashion, Mises rejected the whole notion because th- there that's like looking at the economy, the way like an engineer would model water moving through a pipe and, and Mises, you know, there, there's no, subjective valuation there. That, that's not how economics works to explain anything else. And, and what Mises did in his, what we translate as the theory of money and credit is, is he took the standard tools of subjective marginal analysis and incorporated money in them as well. Like instead of just mm-hmm. doing a barter economy, which most economists had done, Mises explained money and money prices using you know individual marginal analysis, not looking at the economy as a whole with just dollars floating around the system, like like you know, I say water going well, through a pipe or something. Would would natural deflation be a? Um, uh, would that demonstrate the the problem with the quantity theory of money? In other words, in 1990, there were far fewer dollars than today, but a DVD player cost five hundred dollars or something. And now, if anybody even wants to buy one, it's forty dollars. Uh, so we would consider that a happy. Uh, technological version of inflation and obviously demand is dropped, but does that, does, is deflation, price deflation, a refutation of the quantity theory of money? If, if assuming the quantity is increasing. That's a good question. I'm, I'm trying to think like, so for examples like that, I, how would they explain that? I mean, I guess they would say that, yeah, they would say the techno- technology improved, like we're able to make a DVD player with fewer inputs right. than we were before. Right. Um, so I guess the way, the way they would handle that is like total output would go up. Okay. In the equation. And, and so, in the equation, right. right. I, I think that's how they would handle that. Right. Um, all right. So I want to get back to some of these questions and we're rolling. We're, we're working Bob hard here on a Friday afternoon. He's, <laughs> he's, he's hanging in there. Um, but you know, these economists, you can't, you can't let them get away with anything. Uh, this is an interesting question because there's a lot of bad things governments do. And probably, uh, uh worst among them is war. Uh, mm-hmm. they murder people. They use tanks and guns and planes to murder people. So that, I would say that's the worst interventionism of all. But, uh, this question is, are the feds artificially low and falling interest rates, the most deleterious intervention governments can do? Well, they're arguably one of the most ins- insidious, at least if we're restricting the analysis to, uh, you know, economic interventions, you know, as opposed to like messing with school curricula or something like that, which you could argue would be more long term. Um, so, yeah, it, I, I, I'm assuming what the, what the questioner where he or she is coming from is that if the, if the government just spends a billion dollars on some boondoggle project, you know, building a highway somewhere mm-hmm. where it's not really valuable, you know, needed that much. You know, okay, sure, they pay the pockets of the local construction labor unions and things like that, but the public can see what it is and, and it's kind of straightforward. Yep, they spent a billion dollars on that when you know maybe a private contractor could have done it for 300 million or something like that. So people can kind of see the waste and understand it. But when the government, through the central bank typically in modern times, pushes down interest rates to artificially low levels by injecting monetary inflation in the credit markets, it, it sets up the boom bust cycle. And so that that's really so it's it's not just you know 
the problem isn't confined merely to the recipients of the, the, the artificial credit who now have an advantage vis-a-vis -vis those who didn't get the artificial credit and they can kind of command more resources. And so it's not merely the redistribution of real wealth, but it says that the boom bust cycle, which screws everything up and serves to further discredit capitalism because people you know, will say, hey, we need more government intervention. The market's so unstable. This is re a related question to an earlier one about supply chain and prices. It, uh, this is from Michael O'Neill. He asks, are shortages of labor, cars, trucks, drivers, chips, containers, port capacity, et cetera, a result of malinvestment fostered by the boom, which would presumably mean pre-COVID, or is it government spending, stimulus, unemployment benefits, et cetera, which would presumably mean since COVID? Okay, great question. So the quick answer is, you know, I, I haven't done enough quantitative analysis, even if I had two years to do it. I, it's not that I would have been, you know, you can't centrally plan, so you don't know. But I'm saying I haven't even done enough of the back of the envelope to give you like a, a, a strong judgment one way or the other. But let me just remind people of some facts that the yield curve inverted in the, let's yeah. see, August of, I'm getting my, of 2019. Okay. And, and so I, based on like the, the amount of inflation with the rounds of QE and so forth. So I was on record predicting that there was going to be a bad recession in 2020 and 2020. And there was, and now some people can say, well, you got lucky because COVID hit and it was the, you know, it was the lockdowns, you know, who can say we, we, we don't know. Cause we don't see the alternative timeline in which they didn't have the lockdowns. But, um, you know, so I will say that even, and, that, and that's not merely an Austrian thing. Like I'm sure many of the, the viewers know that, an inverted yield curve has predicted uh, a coming recession, I think without fail since World War II at least. So, or right after World War II. So, um, so I think, you know, there, there would have been a bad recession anyway. And then like, like you're saying, Jeff, the, with all the lockdowns and things, you might remember, I was writing about that in the summer of 2020 warning that there, I don't know if I use the term supply chain disruption, but that was the concept I was getting at saying, um, just really, real quickly, I'll re reiterate that even though the unemployment rate hadn't gotten as high as it had been, you know, in, in previous times, um, in terms of breaking all time records or anything like that, it wasn't as high as it had been during the Great Depression. I was pointing out there's a difference, though, with the lockdowns and the unemployment that that caused. It wasn't that people just scaled back where they wanted to, like, like if you were told you had to cut your spending by 10%. You would cut back in those areas where that you could, you know, that were the least essential to you. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the unemployment that was in the lockdowns, it was bureaucrats who were determining what was essential and not. And so the unemployment number there, I thought meant more in terms of the, the harm it was going to cause. And so there's that issue. And then the, the last thing is, yeah, part of what's going on with the labor markets is the unemployment benefits. And for those who don't know, I mean, it's, it's not, exaggeration on the part of Ben Shapiro or something when the, the with the federal amounts there were some people that really were getting paid a lot more to stay home than they had been making it at work so of course and, and I just anecdotally I don't know if this is like this down in Auburn but just driving around there's plenty of like when I was I was recently making a long drive on the interstate in a lot of the like Starbucks and Dunkin Donuts they were all, like some of them were just literally closed because they had staffing shortages you know and you would have thought that that would have been over by now so it's yeah. It really is amazing to see some of these problems, these bottlenecks. Yeah, it really is something. Um, this is, I think, an interesting question. It says, Bob, when do you think central banks could ever raise interest rates again in the current context of trillions of excess liquidity parked by commercial banks with them? And I think that the questioner is, is alluding to the interest on excess reserves, which our Fed pays. But also, Bob, related to that is, is uh, Congress has to pay for interest on the national debt, on treasury debt every year. So those two things, a lot of people say, well, the Fed can never raise rates again. Right. So if you, yeah, if you run the numbers, um, I don't have like a soundbite to give you because I haven't done a calculation recently, but yeah, they, they, they have added, um, if you, you, the figure, if you use the, the public debt that the, you know, the U.S. federal government has, and a lot of times they'll say held by the public and they'll exclude mm -hmm. like this, but just the standard public, like the outstanding treasury, whether it's in the trust fund or not. Uh, something like 126% of GDP right now, right? And it was it was not, I think it was in the 60s, like in 2007 or so, the 60%. So, I mean, that has um, really skyrocketed just to give people an idea of how much debt they piled on, you know, after the financial crisis and then 
you know, because of the, you know, COVID um, to be able to point to mm-hmm. that and all the measures that all the spending involved was involved with that. And, but it's not as painful as it normally would have been to add all that debt because interest rates on treasuries have been so low. And so they sort of, in a sense, have had a margin of error or as the calm before the storm. So yeah, they, they really can't, if they were just to allow treasury uh, yields to rise by a few percentage points, I mean, that would translate into many hundreds of billions of dollars of extra interest expense. And, that, and that's partly why in the CBO's analysis of the long-term budget forecast, it, the, the debt as a share of GDP is kind of flat for a little bit in the tw- mm-hmm. in, for the rest of the 2020s, but then by it starts rising again. And then by, I think it's 2031, they've got it passing the all-time peak that was set right after World War II. And, and that's because of demographics with Medicare and Medi- you know, with, with Social Security, people getting older, but it's also rising interest rates. Just, and, not, and that's not even like a spike because of, of a crisis. That's just interest rates gently rising a bit back towards more historical levels that that's going to just really wreck the budget. Right. And of course, historical le- levels for Treasury debt is somewhere between 5 and 8%. Uh, there's actually a website you can go to that gives you the range of interest payments on Fe- on Treasury debt right now. And for Congress is paying something below 2 percent average across all weighted outstanding Treasury mm-hmm. debt, some of its five year, 10 year, some of its current year. But, you know, they, they weight how much is uh, of each particular type, Treasury bills and Treasury bonds. And so this is less than 2 percent. So if if interest rates were to go to historical average of five to eight uh, percent, that three hundred and fifty to four hundred billion annual line item in Congress's budget to pay interest would quickly go to a trillion or more, and that yep. would be, that yep. would be the single biggest item in the federal budget. That would be more than so-called national defense. It would be more than Social Security, more than Medicare. So that would be a very uh, untenable political situation for Congress and and a brutal one. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to get to a question. This is from Bruce Corber. He says, what's the relation between world reserve currency, which we all know is our exorbitant privilege here in America, and the scheme to globally control the economy? Okay, so it's the exorbitant privilege for people who don't know that term. It's So after World War II, there was the so-called Bretton Woods arrangement, where the idea was that you know, historically, all the major governments had had gold in their vaults, and that was what was backing up their currencies. Um, and then, so after World War II, they, the, the British pound was originally involved too, but then they kind of fell on the wayside. So it was ultimately the US dollar. So that the ma- other major central banks would basically stockpile dollars as their reserves. And then the Fed stood ready to convert dollars um, into gold at the rate of $35 an ounce. And then that's, that's what Nixon famously ended in 1971 when he closed. You know, we recently had the uh, what was it, the 50th anniversary mm-hmm. of that? And so, so that that's so the exorbitant privilege, just to ex- finish that train of thought, was meaning so if, if the other central banks are accumulating dollar reserves, well, how do they get more of those? They got to send the Americans real goods and services, right? If we're going to send them $100 billion in actual, I mean, it's not necessarily pieces of paper with Ben Franklin on them, but you know, electronic, what have you. But if we're going to send those to them or treasuries, then they need to send us something in exchange. They're just going to give them that for free. And so the rest of the world is sending cars and sweaters and, and all the other goodies that Americans get to consume in exchange for sending out those, those dollar stockpiles that they're, they're um, building up. And so that's what the exorbitant privilege was, that it's, you know, it's good to be the king. It's good to be the, the, the central banker of the world. It's good to be the issuer of the world's reserve currency. And, and so that you know, gives you a lot of leverage around the world and, you know, ability to lean on other people. Um, so that is connected with a lot of people who, you know, view central banker types with a nefarious, you know, think that they, they're up to no good. Um, so I don't know exactly if this is what the question is getting at, but there's part of that narrative or what goes along with that perspective is to say a lot of that just rests on confidence. And so right mm-hmm. now, you know, it's still the case, even though Bretton Woods is ended and um, the you know, U.S. isn't redeeming it for gold, still a lot of countries either explicitly or implicitly are pegging their own dollar to or their own currency to the dollar. But that rests on sort of faith and that, you know, if China were to come out next week and say, you know what, we no longer have faith in the Federal Reserve, it's just been printing money like crazy. 
So we're going to get rid of half of our uh, dollar denominated assets. That would probably cause the dollar to crash. And so the, the thinking goes that, you know, there's, there's people and I, why is it that U.S. foreign policy targets some dictators, but not others? Because it's clearly not that they're all the CIA sitting around saying, we really don't like mean people. Let's just do what we can to get rid of it. That's not what happens. Some t- a dictator will be on good graces with the U.S. government one day, and then the next day he's the next Hitler that needs to be taken out. And so there's a plausible case to be made that anytime somebody starts talking about, you know, I'm going to get my country away from the U.S. dollar and let's let's mm-hmm. use something else that all of a sudden that regime goes down. So again, I, I haven't done enough research to know how, how accurate that is, but that's part of the narrative of that to say that's partly how the, the U.S. government has maintained dollar hegemony. Well, I would only add to Bruce's question that we've never had a currency crisis with a world's reserve currency, like gold was the world's reserve cur- currency. So we've had a localized, regionalized currency crisis throughout history, but we haven't had that with the world's reserve currency. So a lot of people like Pat Buchanan say, well, if the dollar ever gets in trouble, that will usher in an era where under the auspices of something like International Monetary Fund, the IMF, you know, swoops in and says, look, we can't have all these countries just issuing their own currency and devaluing them uh, or uh, having currency wars between them. We have to have an overarching global currency system because now, look, even the U.S. dollar has crashed. And that's which that, in fact, of course, would harm uh, pr- pretty much the whole world. So, um you know, the, you don't have to believe in any sort of nefarious intent to say that uh, it, it's a little precarious to have so much of the world's economy hinging on the dollar. Uh, we're just going to do a couple more quick ones here. Uh, I thought this was a great question from Sammy Cartagena, someone I know personally. Sammy says, what are some tangible short-term consequences of central banks keeping interest rates negative in real terms? And of course, in Europe, sometimes they're negative in nominal terms, mm-hmm. um, I, I imagine what the questioner is getting at is the idea that hey, you know, in the Austrian tradition, time preference is supposed to be positive, and so isn't there something screwy with, you know, if, what does it mean if real interest rates are negative? I'm not sure that anything magical happens. Like in other words, if if this because of central bank manipulation, suppose the interest rate, the real interest rate, is supposed to be three percent, and then they push it down to zero point one. I don't know that the difference between that versus negative 0.1 is some huge qualitative you know, difference that um, I think just in general, yes, if, if central banks, I mean, the fact that they're negative, that should jump out at us that something is screwy and this is unnatural, right? So, so to me, that would be the, the most significant element of that. Um, but again, it's interest rates serve a, a function in a market economy. They're a price and they help in the Austrian view, you know, they help allocate the intertemporal coordination, the length of production plans and so forth with consumers' desires to have more goods rather than fewer, but also to get them sooner rather than later. And the trade-offs there, that's partly what the interest rate helps regulate, if you want to use that word. And so when they make it artificially low, that causes an unsustainable production structure. Okay. Um, should the Federal Reserve Bank be considered interventionism. Is that what Mises is talking about here? Is it is, is even having a Fed a form of interventionism? Oh, a- absolutely. Um, you know, w- w- imagine in any other context, you know, we don't have a, a central board of, you know, setting the price of wheat and having a bunch of wheat governors getting together every, every once in a while to determine, you know, how, how many bushels should be produced and what should be the price per bushel. We would all clearly call that, you know, fascism or socialism or something. And so, yeah, they shouldn't be involved with that. And also it does fit, I would say, his dynamic of interventionism. You you look at U.S. history and there were various interventions in money and banking, and then they caused, you know, various panics and so forth. And then that gave rise to, you know, demands for, oh, well, we, you know, we can't have this anarchy of wildcat free banking. So we need to have more intervention and and so, yes, I, I would say that, that that fits the pattern nicely. I don't know off the top of my head if Mises himself ever used central banking mm-hmm. as an example or an illustration of his principle of interventionism, but I think it fits quite well. And certainly he right. would agree that a central bank is not a feature of a market economy. But doesn't the, the Bank of England predates Marx's use of the term capital? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know offhand if uh, Communist Manifesto or Das Kapital 
mention the Bank of England or not. I, I wonder wonder what Marx thinks about central pl- centrally planned money. He probably views probably views central banks as a tool of of, of capital of elites. I I want to say I, it's been a while since I've read the Communist Manifesto. I think they're in the bullet points. Maybe like pushing down interest rates is in there. So, I mean, I I think he does say something about right. what we would right. nowadays call monetary policy, but I don't remember off the top of my head what you don't, it is. You don't have the Communist Manifesto at your bedside at night. <laughs> no. Well, I, we do know no. that Marx says interest rates are a form of exploitation. It's bad enough right. that the capitalist uh, steals some of the workers' output and only pages pays him wages, and but takes skims profit off that. But then he turns around and takes that profit and loans it back to him and charges the poor guy interest. So it's ex- exploitative in that sense. Um, all right, we got w- time for one more. I'm going to answer this one. It says, "Does this is from Mark Collins? Does the Mises Institute hodl Bitcoin in their treasury?" The short answer is yes. Obviously, we get Bitcoin donations from time to time. We don't sell it; we keep it. Um, so, but, but now I want to go to the last question again from Benjamin. He had a question earlier, but, um, and, and this is, this is important because I'm hearing lots of people on the right in libertarian circles who are otherwise sensible people making all kinds of hay about China, China, China. Uh, so Benjamin Nadelstein asked, is China's economy a paper tiger or are they proof that the middle of the road works? So that's, that's a hell of a question. Is it, huh. So it's my thoughts on on China. So I do. I've read some things that, yeah, I, I think that they probably are going to have what we would call a crash at some point. In other words, I, I think that they have a lot of things that were um, male investments in a reasonable sense of that term. Um, but it's, on the other hand, I think partly what's going on with China, or at least historically, is, you know, they had really extreme top down central planning, you know, under Mao. And then they started pulling back from that. And, you know, so there, mm-hmm. there's various amounts of liberalization and like maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, you know, I, I know some guys that like were doing consulting and, and whatnot, or guys who write like financial newsletters and they would go visit China and give feedback to their clients and so forth. And so they, again, it was, it was sort of like you were saying, Jeff, with the neoliberal program, like they're... The, the sense I got was that they weren't so much ideological. They just wanted to see what worked. And so they could look around and say, oh, you know, so it's not that they became believers in, in laissez-faire capitalism, but they could recognize, oh, if we allow, you know, the peasants to own a little bit of farmland, that's one thing. If we allowed them to pool them together into units that were 10 times the size and they could bring in an outside tractor, if they, let's see if that works. Huh, okay, maybe we should let them do that on a, on a limited piecemeal basis over in this province and see how that see how that goes. And then maybe we'll let the, the other province. So I got the sense that they're more like trial and error, just pragmatic. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know if that upsets Mises' thesis or if it's like the, the uh, thesis in, in reverse. Well, I think we got to end it there. It's a little after four central. Again, I want to thank everybody who joined us today and who participated in our fall fundraising campaign last week. You're going to receive this in the mail. The Middle of the Road Leads to Socialism. Great little essay. You can read it in about 20 minutes or so. And, you know, you can't understand any of the things we're talk- talking about today, whether that's China or supply chain or interest rates or shipping uh, or, you know, you can't understand anything without the theory behind it. Uh, I'm reminded of Rothbard's take, you know, what if you brought a Martian in and had him watch uh, people running around Grand Central Station? That Martian wouldn't understand that they were all rushing to go to work or go home or catch a, a subway. So uh, th- this stuff is going to help you. Uh, understand the world. And I really want to ask all of you to continue supporting the Mises Institute. The best way you can do that is just to share uh, everything on our site, uh, to sign up for our daily emails, to follow us on Twitter, uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and basically just help us in every way possible to, to get the word out to people who are really questioning uh, what's going on and worrying about the U.S. It probably in ways that they've never worried about it before. So I want to thank my friend, Dr. Bob Murphy. I want to thank all of you for joining us and we hope you have a great weekend. See you, Bob. Thanks everyone.